Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining and sorry for getting started a few minutes late. I uh, hate to be uh, cutting into our time with Aaron. Uh, we were having some technical difficulties on the back end and uh, just wanted to make sure we had all of those super squared away before we got anything started. So my name is Charlie Schreier. I'm the head of marketing at Team Ohana. I'm really excited about today's webinar uh, with Aaron Solomon. And uh, I think I will actually be hosting today's webinar uh, with Aaron. So um, at this point, uh, I'm actually going to ask Aaron to jump onto the stage with me so I can get him introduced and we can jump right in. Now, while Aaron is joining the stage, uh, I'd like to uh, share with you just a few little things about uh, how this is all uh, going to be working today. So we will have uh, a live chat. Hey, Aaron, thanks so much for joining me up here. We will have a live Hi. chat where you can uh, enter in any of your questions, comments, thoughts. Um, would be great to see see that going just a little bit. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and turn on the Q&A. So uh, you can use the Q&A box uh, to enter any questions you might have for Aaron uh, or for us. So uh, really look forward to this conversation. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, so that we can take a look at our agenda today. Uh, and yeah, let's get started. So here we are. Okay. So after a, a few technical difficulties, and again, sorry about all that, and sorry for getting started late, uh, we are here to talk about workforce planning in 2024. So we're going to basically talk a little bit about setting the stage and just kind of saying, um, this is what we're doing here, right? Obviously, this is a very hot topic at the moment. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll let Aaron talk a little bit about Docker, where they are in their growth journey. Uh, and then we'll really just jump into the meat of the conversation. And one of the things that's great about the conversation, it's a lot of the how. What does planning look like? How is he collaborating with others? Um, how is he gaining visibility and control and reducing manual work so that they can make better decisions and really being strategic? So, and then we'll answer any of the questions that you all may have. So. Uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's jump in. So what are we all doing here? 70% of your operating costs are workforce headcount, right? This matters. This is a big deal. Um, I think what what we what we're seeing in in the world today is that modern workforce planning is moving in a new direction. Uh, we've all been through the planning sessions and seasons where uh, all of your data is siloed in different places. You're making reactive decisions about uh, different things that are happening, and you're not being able to do those things in real time. Um, you're not being able to see into the future in real time because all of the data is lagging. Um, there's very little automation, and I think what, what Aaron will talk a little bit about is, is how they've pulled some of the manual work and manual processes and data entry into spreadsheets and waiting on other people um, to provide a little more automation and, and make some of those insights and data come to life uh, in real time. And, and ultimately, just providing more control over your workforce planning process than confusion. And, and that's what we hear a lot when we talk to our customers is just eliminating that confusion of who updated this? When did this happen? What is the real salary here? Did the target start date change? All of these different kinds of things that happen in the planning season, um, really eliminating that confusion and, and bringing more control to that. So, um, Aaron, I want to turn it over to you just to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about you know your your career as a as a financial analyst, um, and then also just introduce Docker a little bit and and just tell folks just a, a a brief amount about about the company so that they can start to make their relationships between their own their own organizations. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Charlie. So I'm super excited to be here. Um, so I've been working at Docker on the finance team for about two years now. Um, I've been here uh, just over a year ago, raised 100 million plus Series C. Um, so we've been going through a hyper growth mode, doubling revenue, headcount, um and whatnot so it's been a really exciting time to be here um kind of what is docker really we're building apps products um that help increase the time developers spend on innovation decrease the time they spend on anything else so developer obsessed hyper growth mode um really exciting and fun time to be here awesome that's great um so without further ado let, let's let's start talking a little bit about uh 
about headcount planning, about workforce planning at Docker. So let's just get started. I, so I'm actually, we're just gonna do the fireside chat. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, because that way we can just focus on the conversation. So let's just start where, where you start. So what does planning season look like at Docker? How do you actually build the plan? Uh, yeah, so planning usually kicks off about three years ahead of the new year. So um, say new kind of new calendar year, 2024 will kick off October timeframe. Uh, and it usually starts with uh, an executive team uh, meeting up, aligning on the long-term strategic, strategic plan. So where do we want to be one year, three year, five years from now? Um, and just really exploring that, like where do we want to kind of double down on priorities? We have near-term priorities. Uh, current products in the market, uh, but then also things like more long-term bets, like do we want to expand into new markets? Do we want to bring new products to market? Um, so just kind of looking at those types of things, aligning on priorities, uh, where do we want to invest in the company? Um, things like that. And it's really looking at it from a more strategic high-level perspective, like what once we kind of have this alignment across the executive team, um, what metrics do we want to track? Um, do we want to look at user engagement? Do we like things like monthly active users, weekly active users, uh, retention, like net dollar retention, gross dollar retention. Uh, and then of course you want to kind of increase your revenue, things like that, subscription seats, dollars per seat, things like that. Um, and so it's a very collaborative process, I'd say, from the executive team as they go through revisions of this pro uh, process, figuring out like, what is a best in class company how can we get there? How can we invest and grow our company to get there? Um, and so it's pretty important to do that. Um, once really the executive team has kind of aligned on these objectives, uh, they'll draft up memos, uh, a little bit more tactical execution plans. Um, and that's kind of, it'll go a couple of weeks, a month, anywhere from a month, month and a half to two months, where they're really setting the targets for one year, three years out, where do we want to be? So I think you 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 talk a lot about right alignment and and bring starting with the executive team and what I also heard was short term and long term goals right like short and long term priorities and thinking about those things um, you know like what are the long term bets right um, there, there was also some I think you also mentioned it starts three uh, three months before right so in October and you're thinking about what are those long term bets uh, that are that are looking a few a few years potentially out. So can you maybe give an example of something that is like a long-term bet that, that you recently did that, that might help people to understand like the difference maybe between what the, the near term and the long term and, and how you use those to really put together your plan? Yeah. So, I mean, near term uh, existing products in the market, how can we grow, expand them, uh, build on them, but then a more long-term bet, I mean, an example would be last year we decided we want to double down on secure software supply chain. Um, and so ultimately what this meant was we were going to kind of allocate resources, investments to double down on this. We built out uh, new engineering teams, products teams to build the product. Uh, we scaled up the go-to-market functions so that we can bring this product to market. Um, and ultimately, um, pretty recently this past year, we brought a kind of relatively new product to the market. Um, so it was it's exciting to see from planning to execution the entire life cycle of something like that. Yeah, definitely. And and so you're kind of taking a look at all of this. And then at what point do you and the, in the you know, financial planning team, at what point does, does FP&A get involved? So after the executive strategic plan, the long range plan has been um, kind of identified. The next step is the CFO will work with the director of finance. Um, that's who uh, is my manager. And they'll work on identifying the, the operating profile of our company. So we'll look at industry benchmarks, uh, comparable companies. Uh, what does a best in class company look like from an operating perspective? And then look at certain metrics, so financial metrics, targets, um, and call them financial goalposts, uh, where it's like, we want to have revenue grow at this percentage. We want to maintain, I don't know, 10%, 20% profitability. So uh, healthy EBITDA margin. Um, a good one to look at is rule of 40, so which kind of brings together um, top line growth as well as profitability. And then things like from an investment perspective, 
how much do we want to spend on R and D as a percent of revenue? How much from sales and marketing as a percent of revenue? And so once we've set those targets, um, we can generate from kind of looking at the financials, we can generate an investment package that we're ultimately going to move forward for the year for the entire company's budgets. And then we can also get to using different uh, metrics like R and D percent of revenue, sales and marketing percent of revenue, we can get to an allocation of how we want to invest across the company. Um, and so that's the first step is identifying the dollars, but then you can also use a few other metrics like revenue per employee or expenses per employee, where you can back into an implied number of headcount that you ultimately want to get to by the following year. Do you have any examples of some of those, you know, maybe metrics that, that people might be able to use um, like some, some like more specific examples in terms of like, you know, revenue per employee or, or how much you kind of think about allocating, you know, the, the, the dollars between sales, marketing, and, and, and some of those pieces there that yeah, you can share sure. at least. I, I mean, I mean, just as an example, you can say, say we want to have 10% profitability at the bottom line. Uh, we don't want to spend more than 40% of our revenue on R and D 30% on sales and marketing, 50% everything else. Uh, you can basically triangulate those metrics along with what your top line targets look like to actually back into what that investment looks like. Uh, and that's just kind of like, that's the process of the CFO working with the director of finance, working with the rest of the finance team so that we can ultimately get to this, this investment number that we can ultimately deploy to the company so they can start building their hiring plan. Perfect. And, and then at that point, I imagine that you're starting to bring in some of those department leaders to determine basically how their allocation is going to be set up from like a bottoms up perspective. Yeah. So this is the next step. This is where the, the rubber hits the road. It's time to actually build that hiring plan. Um, so we have our uh, investment packages, budget envelopes that we'll ultimately be sharing with each leader, each executive, executive leader. Um, but there's a lot of inputs that need to go into building a bottoms up hiring plan. Um, so just to name a few, you need to have compensation data, um, a job catalog. So it has job function. So a software engineer, account executive, financial analyst, uh, needs to have levels, locations, and then cost impact associated to all of these different inputs. Um, and you need to make sure you're using updated numbers. You don't want to use last year's numbers because compensation data can change over the years. Um, and then you get to countries, regions, uh, we have employees in 13 countries so far. Do we plan to hire in other countries? So there's load factors associated to every single country. Uh, each country has different taxes, payroll taxes, benefits packages, you name it. All of these are inputs that we need to make sure we have correct uh, and making sure that they're updated. Um, but then on top of countries, we plan a budget in USDs. Do we need to make sure that we have the conversion rates correct? Um, are we using last year's conversion rates? Are we using this year's conversion rates? Are we setting them at the beginning of budgeting process? Are we setting them at the kind of beginning of the new year? Uh, lots of moving parts, but then, and then you also need to know the start date and time and timing assumptions. Uh, we can in, we can say that the engineering org can hire 50 people, but we need to have the timing assumptions because sure, 50 engineers may all have the same annualized costs, but if you hire one in the first month of the year, versus the last month of the year, there's a very diff there's a very big difference in that fiscal impact. Definitely. And and I imagine that this this process and in, in figuring out where and how and all that kind of stuff is a very collaborative or at least highly communicative process between the finance team and the department leaders. And I imagine probably also other members of the sort of like headcount touching personnel team, like talent or recruiters or things like that. Is this, is this the part where things start to become, you know, more and more collaborative? Yeah. It, I mean, it's definitely it, the collaborative collaboration needs to happen at every step of the way. Um, but it's definitely a collaborative process of kind of the finance team building a spreadsheet, a model, a template framework, whatever it may be um, to share with, each of the executive leaders. Um, we really should be working with the talent team to understand what are the hiring plan objectives so that we can scale up the recruiting team um, so that we can hire these people on time. Uh, the people team you know, needs to be involved in collaborating as well from kind of an org design perspective, um, kind of span of control and things like that. So definitely a lot of collaboration, um, working in spreadsheets, 
Zoom meetings, Slack, uh, you name it, any way we can get there. Uh, but as we're collaborating, finance does have a, a very key role in making sure that these budget owners are able to build a hiring plan that gets them to their top line objectives, but also stays within the budget envelope. So at the beginning of planning, CFO, director of finance say, hey, here's our investment profile that's going to get us to our kind of desired outlook one year from now. Uh, we need to make sure that they're staying within the, the, that budget envelope. Uh, and we also need to enable them to do that through building a lightweight, efficient spreadsheet so that they can come in, just input a few things, the, the bare minimum basic details that we need, you know, software engineer, financial analyst, things like this, and then maybe give us some start date assumptions and immediately kind of spits out cost assumptions. Um, so it needs to be scalable. They need to be able to change any of the inputs and the top line number of how much they're spending, uh, are they over or under plan? It needs to be very efficient um, and accurate. Right. So, so just as a, you know, we've, we've kind of reached a, maybe the 15 minute mark in our, in our conversation so far, just as a, as a minor recap of what we've talked about so far, you know, we talked about where you get started and it really starts with that executive alignment, setting the top line goals, setting the top line budgets, bringing in, and then at this point, you know, the FP&A team and starting to understand what are the key metrics that we want to pay attention to? Um, how do we incorporate, you know, revenue per employee allocation to different departments um, and understanding what are the different envelopes that we're going to start giving out to the department heads? The department heads then go and start to build their bottoms up plan, determining, you know, their headcount budget versus their non-headcount budget and some of the different pieces um, in, in that process. And at this point is when things start to become a bit more collaborative. The, the department leaders are building the bottom up. The finance team is bringing in, you know, sort of that lightweight ability for the, the, the department leaders to build their plans and adjust their plans and see real time cost implications um, and talent sort of guiding on some of these different things. So there's a lot of moving pieces all at once and, and a lot of different people who need to be involved. Fair recap of, of what we've talked about so far? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. All right. So then then in that case, let's um let's let's keep going. Let's talk at this point about, you know, how you're how you're starting to like let me let me let me let me start over. You're starting to operationalize the plan, right? You need to actually now you've started to figure out the plan, you've got something that is like a working plan, how do you get it to the point where it's something that's being worked on to approved, let's go execute it and, and start to put it into operations? Uh, yeah, it's a it's great question. It's, it's definitely a, an iterative process. You definitely go through V1, V2, V3 of the bottoms of hiring plans. Uh, so it's keeping that kind of open, open communication channel with the executive team, the budget managers, even the hiring managers, if um, kind of depending on how many headcount are going to roll up into them in this new plan. Um, so it's doing that iterative process, consolidating the numbers, rolling them up. Are we in or over budget? Um, which actually is one place that I call out. It's definitely a, a, a challenge. Um, kind of, as you consolidate things up, you need to be able to get to quick numbers very quickly and be able to work with those executive members to say, hey, are you in budget, over budget, and then help them to get to a place where they are in budget and also getting to their objectives. Uh, definitely a challenge. It's kind of pulling, pooling all this information across different spreadsheets, different templates. There's usually one for each function. So definitely a, a time-consuming process um, as you go through the, the revisions. But once we have rolled everything up, uh, it fits into our financial profile of best-in-class CEO, CFO sign off on it. Um, the plan is locked. Hiring plan is locked. Green light. We are ready to go. Uh, final plan will be shared with the talent team, the people team, um, so they can really kickstart recruiting. Yeah, and 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 this is actually, I think, a point that that we've talked about, um, not in this webinar, but we've talked about offline around bringing talent in potentially earlier, right? Because talent has all these different things they need to think about. Um, it would be great if you could talk about the, the back and forth maybe between your, you and your talent team and how you think about involving them or, or maybe the goal that you have around involving them sooner so that it doesn't feel like you're throwing the plan over the fence. Yeah. 
definitely. Uh, so I've definitely worked on a, a handful of bottoms up hiring plan builds since I've been working at Docker. I will say talent should be involved extremely early um, because regardless of how many people we want to hire, um, we could want we could hire plan to hire 100 people every single quarter. If we don't have the recruiting capacity and the bandwidth to do that, we just can't get there. So involving them early is crucial so that they can scale their team to meet these objectives um, because it's really just a ratio. The recruiting team is just a ratio of how many new hires we plan to get to. Um, if we have five recruiters, they can handle three racks a month. You know, 15, that's 15 new hires on the month. Well, if the entire company's hiring plan demands 75, uh, it's just, that's not necessarily realistic with where we are right now. So we would either need to scale back overall company headcount, um, scale up the recruiting team, or do a combination of both. So that's why it's really important to involve them early on. But then from a from an overall people organization perspective, um, it's important to look at organizational, organizational design pretty early on. Um, how many managers do we have? How many direct reports do they have? What's the span of control? Uh, we don't want to overload the managers where there's too many people below them. So involving the people ops team, uh, people partners, bringing them in so that they can look at those types of data points and making sure that the entire people organization is aligned and in agreement with the rest of the company's hiring plan. Yeah, it, absolutely. I, I love that you talked about both sides of the coin there, where it's not just about the, the capacity, but it's also about what is our company going to look like and and how do we support all of these new people that are coming in? Because that's such an important element of the hiring growth and, and of the growth of the company is that all these people need to be supported. They need to have the things that they need in order to get their jobs done and support the top line initiatives and you know, help hit the goals that these department leaders are working towards. So that I think that's what makes headcount, you know, different than just being able to set aside a budget, right? It's, there's a lot of other complexities and nuances that come with hiring people. They're not just numbers, uh, you know, numbers on a board, so to speak. Um, so talent and, and people, they need to be involved a little earlier. Do you, do you feel like that's up to the finance team to start to bring them into the fold sooner? Is it up to the talent team to insert themselves? How do you, how do you think about that back and forth? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think at the end of the day, finance generally will own the hiring plan because ultimately a hiring plan at the end of the day is a dollar assumption. We have employ new employees, uh, existing employees, you know, at the end of the day, finance needs to roll it up so that we can see what the overall financial impact will be of the hiring plan. So I think it starts with finance, but I and I think it's it's finance involving recruiting, reaching out to recruiting talent teams, people teams, uh, and just bringing them into conversations with um, executive members. So say we've gone through uh, the first version of the bottoms up build, um, maybe that's the time to bring in the talent teams and say, hey, just at a high level, does this seem realistic? Um, does this impact how you're going to staff your team up? Um, and just bringing them in relatively early. Um, I think it would be a little bit more of a, a finance driven initiative doing that, um, because generally the finance team is the ones working very closely tactically with, uh, the budget owners, the leaders, the hiring managers to build the plans. Uh, so I think you need to bring them in relatively early on and they are almost, they, they are a stakeholder in this process as well, because they're ultimately going to be the ones day to day operationalizing this. Yeah. I think, I think we would, we would definitely agree on that for sure. Um, so let's, let's like maybe uncover a little bit more around some of the hiring plan pieces. So I think what you just talked about, right. You bring them in out of V1, start to go through some of the revisions. I think this is where a lot of people experience like inefficiencies, right. Where you're doing these revisions, you're trying to keep everything consolidated in one source of truth so to speak and it's challenging like what are some of the areas where you're finding that there are major inefficiencies in that process of you know building that hiring plan and, and getting it to that final stage uh, uh many <laughs> um let's see i think some of the key ones i touched on a bit earlier but one of them is just making sure that you have all of the relevant data points available. Um, like from, from an input perspective, we need to have compensation data, we need to have currency rates, we need to have load factors, and we need to make sure that one, all of that information is correct, 
it's updated is reflective of this new year. Um, but then also that we're using the same information across the board. So um, we're ultimately going to kind of create different models, different spreadsheets for each function, making sure that all of those inputs are the exact same for each function. Uh, and each one of these inputs is its own spreadsheet model in itself. So it's being able to kind of pull all of this together into just a very lightweight spreadsheet that the, the executive team can use. Uh, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to build their hiring plan and see the dollars. But from a, a back-end perspective, we need to do a lot of work to enable them to get there. Uh, I think that's a, a big, that's definitely a challenge. Um, another one is just con consolidating the numbers. Uh, so sure, we can maybe yeah, run a formula that gets us to a total of total fiscal impact of a hiring plan than a spreadsheet. But um, as we go through the revisions, we want to see the total company impact. We need to pull from lots of different spreadsheets. Um, I've had experience working hiring plans and spreadsheets, notion boards, Miro boards, um, you name it. And so it's just making sure that you have, you know where the sources of truth are and you have that finance source of truth. Uh, we, we would actually, when we created our hiring plan builds, we would call them finance source of truth hiring plan, just so that we knew um, kind of where we're working off of what's ultimately going to get loaded into our FP&A system. It's the one that's on that's titled finance source of truth. Uh, I think those are definitely some inefficiencies you run into. It's challenging, but it is important to get the hiring plan right because at the end of the day, you need people to to that people are the DNA. You need them to bring new products to market, sell the products. So it's important to design a system that incorporates all of these kind of inputs, data points, details. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So we've talked about some of the inefficiencies. We've talked about getting to the hiring plan. We, we touched on locking the hiring plan a little bit. Um, but now we're going to start, you know, going and hiring, right? The recruiting team is ready. They're, 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 they're scaled in order to meet the demands of the hiring plan. You're, you've finalized the overall budget. What does, what does the next few steps look like and how do you stay close on you know, what all the different teams and all the different moving pieces are doing. Yeah, so we have our, we'll have a final hiring plan. It's been signed off uh, from the executive team. Um, it's, it's, I would say operationalizing it is more so on the talent side. Uh, uh, having them, having talent work with the hiring managers, understanding what the timing assumptions are for some of those near-term high priority roles and getting them opened up in the headcount system. So in the ATS, working with the hiring managers to uh, kind of identify a few roles that they plan to open, opening them in the ATS and activating recruiting. Uh, from an actual operational hiring perspective, I think finance is a bit less, bit more removed from that component to it. That's when talent and hiring managers are really working closely together. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's off of the, the hiring plan that, that finance owns. So we're definitely in there um, kind of as support, as lifeline, if any changes need to be made, generally if it impacts the budgets, um, that's finance is part of those conversations. But I think it's definitely talent led to really operationalize it. I totally agree. And, and But you obviously have to stay close, right? And you obviously have to understand how hiring is progressing uh, as the finance team. And then obviously the department leaders need to understand a lot of the same things because as hiring progresses, things are going to change and you may need to adjust your goals. If you're a department leader, you may need to, you certainly need to adjust your forecast as, you know, maybe something doesn't happen in the time that it expected. So maybe you're hiring somebody sooner. Maybe you're changing out different levels, right? There's lots of different changes that are happening as the plan is operationalized. How do you stay close on that? And how do you make sure that your data is up to date and, 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 you know, looking at the right things? Yeah, definitely. So we will run, we run a monthly forecast process um, from a financial perspective. Uh, so at the end of the month, we will come in. So finance team will come in, review the hiring plan, what roles have been filled, um, match those up against kind of the head count that they feel that the employee filled, what roles are in progress, uh, what roles have not been started yet um, for in the future. And actually as of this past year, so beginning of this current year, we rolled out a new process uh, it's more collaborative. It brings in hiring managers, recruiters, talent teams, and finance all in one place that we can get a more accurate forecast. Uh, and so the way it works is 
talent will work with hiring managers to review. So this, this, this happens at the end of the month, first, first few days following that month. Talent works with the hiring managers to look at all the in-progress roles um, and adjust those start dates. Um, and then hiring managers will look at anything that's not started in their hiring plan and adjust those start dates. And we have criteria set up so that for simplicity, say we, we plan we plan headcount to be one in Europe, in US, the other in Europe. Uh, the criteria would be a US role that's in progress. We're going to delay that by 30 days. Uh, if it's if a US role is not started, we'll delay it 45 to 60 days. Um, and then in Europe, longer time to hire study from the date of opening the rack to actually someone in seat um, at the company. Europe, we'd say if it's in progress, we delay that anywhere from 45 to 60 days. And then if it's not started, We'll delay that about 60 to 90 days, but generally closer to that 90 day period. Uh, and then we ultimately consolidate this data from our hiring plan, load that into our FNA tool so that we can get um, the latest forecast, the outlook of what the hiring plan is going to look like. But ultimately, hiring data, hiring dollars are anywhere 60, 70, 80 percent of the cost. So it, it has the biggest impact on kind of what the forecast looks like and as it progresses over time. Uh, and it definitely takes time. Um, I mean, I've spent anywhere from six, eight hours uh, a week focusing on headcount, doing this consolidation. But it is so crucial because at the end of the day, we need to know how we're, how we're progressing against our goals. The CFO wants to know, are we on track on hiring? Are we on track top line? If we're, if we're behind on hiring, are we at risk of not heat hitting those top line objectives? Or on the flip side, are we on track with hiring from a numbers perspective? But have we hired people so far, say in the first quarter, higher cost bases and at risk of going over budget? All of these things are what we need to, it, are the importance of having this, this latest and greatest forecast um, so that the CFO can work with the team, the rest of the executive team to say, hey, here's how we're progressing. Here are places where we can take action to um, get us on track or just understanding that we are on track. Uh, so all of these things go into the monthly process. It's so it's it's crucial to have an operating business, um, kind of keeping within your financial goal, goal posts, as we say in the finance team. But uh, all of this builds up. It's extremely important. So, how much time does this process take? Right, like that that that's a detailed process. Now, I, I appreciate that you went into detail, but obviously that that's going to take some time to get through. So, like, how much time are you like are you spending? right now on that process? Um, so, I mean, I will say having a, a framework in place, you know, like I was mentioning, definitely helps. Um, I would say before we had this framework, it's it's almost just an ad hoc, where do you think this role is gonna land? It's not open, when do you think it's gonna open? I, you know, so, so really going line by line, doing lots of manual adjustments. I think before we had this framework in place, uh, it was, I mean, 20, 30% of my week could be spent on hiring, um, you know? Um, and it's mostly just from the manual processes of this. Having the framework in place makes it a bit easier so you can follow kind of a system. Everyone's on the same page. Hiring managers know, uh, talent teams know what to do. Uh, finance kind of at the end of the day, we're consolidating numbers. We know what changed, we know why. Uh, it's still gonna take hours, hours a day, uh, kind of updating the start dates, checking to make sure that where any levels changed. If we upgraded a level for a role, uh, making sure that the compensation data change because ultimately a software engineer level three is going to have higher comp than a software ledger, software engineer level two. two. Same thing with uh, locations. If, it, if a location changed, um, there's different compensation bands for the same role, but in US versus Europe. So doing all of this on, I'd say, close to a monthly basis, uh, it definitely takes hours. Uh, I mean, eight hours, 10 hours, 10%, 20% of my week. Uh, just depends on kind of how, how I guess, the volume of changes that were made um, and just taking in time numbers. The framework is in though. So we'll, we'll, we're gonna get to in just a minute, you know, how you're doing it today and, and, and the time that you're, you're saving in regards to being able to pull out of that data and have visibility. Before we do that, you talked a little bit about the FP&A tool and you know, naturally, FP&A tools do have some planning capabilities, but it sounds like you're using an FP&A tool, you know, alongside this, you know, alongside a, 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 another planning tool. So how, you know, what, what are the differences? How, how do those two things play together? Um, 
they there's there's definitely some limitations. I will say, uh, at the end of the day, the numbers and data that are in the FPNA tool are the source of truth um, for our financials. You know, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, everything comes out of there. Um, so at the end of the day, it stops at finance. It's kind of that's where the dollar sits. But from a workforce planning perspective, sure, it does have a place for us to load in our headcount data, um, kind of generate those headcount costs, salaries, taxes, benefits, um, applying the load factors, any other um, kind of fringe benefits, things like that. We're able to get to that granularity in the tool. But from an actual workforce planning perspective, the collaboration isn't there. The real-time visibility isn't really there. Um, it's not necessarily integrated with our headcount systems. Um, so we have our ATS system for talent and hiring managers to work on hiring people, kind of operationalizing the hiring plan. We have our HRIS where um, hired employees go to sit, and that's the system of record, source of truth for kind of the employees on board. They don't necessarily all talk to each other. So it's it's you really don't have real-time visibility. Um, if someone wants to make a change, say, in, it, in the, the bespoke hiring plan spreadsheet, uh, that's not automatically syncing up with our FP&A tool. So... Things like that definitely are some of the inefficiencies in the process. Um, a couple other just to mention, I mean, there's not necessarily a, uh, an approval flow set up. So for example, if you want to request new headcount, that's not something integrated with the fp tool, or you want to level something up. You wanted to hire um, an individual contributor, and now you want to level up to a manager because you think you need more managerial support. That should go through approval change. It should be approved by finance. It should be approved by the manager, the leader, it should be approved by the CFO. This is also something that's not necessarily in the FPNA tool. Um, so then it it leads us to create our own kind of steps in approval flows um, so that we can at least kind of achieve uh, our desired process. Yeah, no, that's very helpful, I think, because there's, again, there's a lot of nuance sort of associated with headcount and, and it's important to see how those two things play together. And, you know, naturally this is all leading to a conversation a little bit about, you know, we talked a lot about inefficiencies. We talked a lot about challenges, pain points uh, with, you know, old processes. Um, you know, Docker is a Team Ohana customer, right? So, you're using Team Ohana. You're, I would say, one of the power users of, of how we're doing things. What does that process look like in Team Ohana? Like, how, how do you kind of kickstart planning? And and how are you, you know, we talked about time savings, right, with your new framework. Like, talk a little bit about what that planning process looks like and how you've made it more collaborative and how you're saving time across all these different places. Are you saying, like, how, how time savings within Team Ohana? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to kind of understand how you're thinking about like kickstarting the planning process and and how you're doing a lot of these things that you talked about, right? I think Docker has some really incredible things to learn, or sorry, people on the webinar have a lot of things to learn from, from Docker's sort of incredibly detailed and thoughtful process about how you think about hiring, how you think about growth, collaboration, communication. Now, all those things had challenges that were associated with it but you were doing it with all of the right intentions and with, with the, the, the goal of efficient growth, responsible growth, not getting too far out over your skis, making sure that the company was hitting its goals, but also hitting hiring targets within budget, right? All of those kinds of things. So this is it's becoming a bit of a loaded question, which I'm realizing, but um, let's talk a little bit about planning in Team Ohana, right? Like what does that look like and, and how is it, helping to save you time while still providing those same benefits that, that you're looking for at Docker. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess context on how we have been planning in the past and how we plan to change it and improve it in the future. In the past, it's been in spreadsheets. Um, we've built bottoms up plans in spreadsheets, consolidate everything, kind of related to everything I've discussed. Inefficiency is very difficult from a collaboration perspective, accuracy perspective, timing perspective, efficiency perspective. Uh, going forward, this is actually something that I'm extremely excited about within Team Ohana is being able to build a bottoms up plan in, in within the system. Um, so ultimately, starting I think when we kick off hiring the the, the new hiring plan process, um, we're going to be using the new concept of scenarios in in Team Ohana. 
uh, we can identify budget envelopes for each function. We're going to kind of allow the, the, the leaders to build their bottoms up hiring plans from a blank space. Uh, we'll have our job catalog in place. We already have the load factors and assumptions built into the tool. We've already kind of layered in the currency rates. And if we need to adjust, if we need to adjust any of these things, it's as simple as going kind of system backend change updates, everything across the board. Uh, and then from a collaboration perspective, we've been using the tool for a while. All of our hiring managers, leaders, talent team, they're all in the tool. Uh, so ultimately we'll be able to have each function build their bottoms of plan. They can bring in people, talent, finance to collaborate on it. Uh, so instead of having these very, um, I guess, manual consolidation process, validating that the numbers are good, we can get a live picture into how we're doing kind of from a top banner, here's your total expenses at the top. And then a tracker, how are we doing versus that? Um, can I, can, do I need to level up people? Do I need to push people back? It's as easy as a couple of clicks of the button. Uh, so that is what we're planning to do. I'm extremely excited about doing that um, within the next few months. It, it, I think what um, you, you can, uh, one thing you started to talk a little bit about is this idea of like agile decision making, right? And being able to look at things in real time and get your snapshot and start to make some more agile decisions on the fly that, that aren't going to impact layers and layers and layers of challenges um, like they may have in the past. So what are some of those decisions like? Do you have any examples of, of things that you feel like you can make decisions about and help guide decisions around like that you wouldn't have been able to do before? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is a place where we could give a quick example structure that if, if you think I should go for it. Um, through using the, the scenarios. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm open to it. I, I think um, if, if you can, do you know how to share your screen on here? There should be a little share button. I think so, let's see. Uh, all right. If you've got it pulled up, let's, let's take a look. Yeah. And should be there. All right, can we see this screen? Yeah, you're good. Cool. So an example demo of this kind of feature within the tool. Um, we've been scaling up the sales team. Uh, we want to, we've been scaling up the reps, but we need some more uh, business development rep support to come on board. So we want to hire two new BDRs, but directed from the sales leader is that We've been hiring at higher costs, so this ultimately adding two BDRs needs to ultimately save us $100. So come in, we can create a scenario. We can do um, updates. We will choose a couple sales departments. See if we can get there. All right. So we want to add one, two, uh, Business development representative, column level twos. And they'll both be in the US. So we can see that's driving about 15K of incremental dollars. Now let's look at the rest. We want to ultimately get to 100K in savings. So let's say that we want to delay all of these roles. None of these are started. Let's update the start date to be 90 days in the future. Well, we've already saved over 100K in savings. We can now bring some of these back by, we could bring these, let's say, let's see, I think, honestly, for the sake of the example, pretty much we've gotten to that savings while we've also added two new headcounts. Uh, we can see the savings here. We can see the incremental number of headcount here, the variance to the budget here, 62% under budget. I think that is so powerful because this is something that would have taken hours, maybe days, conversations to do in a spreadsheet. Um, it's just being able to quickly make that decision, say, we want to add headcount, but we want to save dollars on it. Like, you know, that's almost like conflicting uh, kind of views and data points. We're able to do that really quickly load those into the system 
get the pro get the proper approvals within the system, and then initiate hiring on those BDRs. Yeah, th thanks for uh, thanks for showing us. Um, I how do you think about who's doing that? Right? Is that something that you're guiding the department leader to go do, or is that something that you're walking them through and, and how are you collaborating on that with them? Right. Because obviously they can go do it. It's almost like self-service in a way um, for the department leader to, to, to go put that together. Are you then collaborating with that, with him or her on that process at that point? Are you, or like, at what point do you like you come back in and sort of say, Hey, great job or, or whatever that, whatever that looks like. And how does talent get informed of all these uh, adjustments? Um, yeah, I mean, within the tool we have, there's the ability to collaborate, you can bring in anyone into a scenario, into a headcount, collaborate with them. There's a comment thread that you can kind of, kind of communicate with. Um, but if, if, if someone wants to create the scenario on their own, they can then ultimately submit this entire thing um, as a new scenario, which then triggers an approval flow, finance, talent, head of the, head of the people org, CFO, we're all on this approval chain. Uh, so it's almost just like an automated system. You don't need to have those you know, multiple Zoom meetings, the Slack messages. Hey, am I in budget? Hey, can I add two new BDRs? Yes, but we want to save hundred thousand dollars. You know, all of these things take time. It's it's individual messages, it's meetings. It just it's tedious. Um, and having the ability to do this all in one place, everyone everyone's in one place. Approval flow, flows are in place. We have all the data we need. It's a huge time savings because it's ultimately it's less meetings on your calendar. It's less messages you need to kind of maintain in your Slack. So overall, it's just an efficient, more efficient process. Excellent. Um, very, very, very helpful and, and insightful. And, and thanks for walking us through all that. We're, we're at about seven minutes left uh, in our time. So I do want to open it up if anybody does have questions that they want to enter in the Q&A or into the chat. Um, you can go ahead and do that. Um, we did get one question from Amar uh, around anonymized benchmarking. I don't know if that's something you want to tackle, Aaron. Um, but uh, if for, for product specific questions, kind of like that, we, we can tackle those things um, in, a, in a more detailed kind of call so that we can understand what you're looking for specifically and, and not necessarily speak out of turn and, and, and lead you down the wrong path. We want to make sure we understand the need um, for, for that. But I don't know if that's anything you want to touch on either, Aaron. You can also pass. Uh, so it's asking does any anonymized benchmarking for similar companies? Uh, I feel like it's definitely more in your realm. Uh, I will defer yeah, to you. That's on fine. That. Well, Amar, we will uh, we will follow up with you and, and answer your question in a little more detail, um, and, and also probably get some more some more details from you as well. If anybody else has any questions, you can go ahead and enter them in the Q and A. And while we're doing that, um, we can also talk a little bit about just you know what the future you talked about the future of workforce planning at, at at docker you know what are some other elements maybe that we haven't touched on today um that that you are excited about being able to do um you know going forward i mean if there you know there's there's lots of different elements to workforce planning and we talked about a lot of them um but but what uh what are you excited about for sort of like the next frontier what am i excited about um, let's see. I mean, I'm always excited about kind of, kind of building out on top of new processes, building on top of existing processes or building new processes that are just more scalable, more efficient. Um, uh, like I just showed like quickly that, that concept of building a scenario, but having everything in one place, being able to build something bottoms up, uh, collaborate real time data, um, and then ultimately get the proper approvals, operationalize it all in one place. Everyone is in the same place. All of the data that you need is there. Um, it, I'm just excited about the efficiencies um, and kind of how much automation has been kind of brought into this kind of building a headcount process. So kind of going from that, the, the overall process, starting with the executive team, aligning our strategic, strategic objectives. How, what is the life cycle of that? you know, speeding up the time from building that bottoms up plan to operationalizing it, um, making sure that we have all of the relevant stakeholders in place to get all the input we need. Uh, just seeing those efficiencies uh, through Team Ohana, through other processes as we build up kind of that monthly forecast process that I was discussing. That was a huge plus for us. 
um, it kind of really impacted the accuracy of our forecast and improved it. Um, so I'm excited about things that I haven't done yet that I don't know about yet. So I think we'll see what comes in the next year, uh, but I'm sure there'll be a lot of new efficiencies in automation. Great. Uh, love it. And, and one of the, I mean, what you were talking about just now, I think is, you know, echoes what we talked about at the beginning of the, of the webinar, just around this idea of modern workforce planning and collaboration, right. Instead of the silo data, being able to make agile and proactive decisions, automation coming in and then control and, and being able to make the changes that you made right, right there in the platform, uh, without getting any, without really getting confused, you had the context, you understood why you, you saw what the goals were, um, all within one sort of single view without the back and forths, without the, you know, lost in translation that sometimes happen. I think the other thing that you talked about, which actually isn't even on this slide is the idea of like visibility for everyone and being able to provide something, you know, to a department leader that they can see and that the talent team can very easily see and, and get visibility into. So like visibility and control are two of the things that we we talk a lot about at Team Ohana and certainly things that you brought to life for us when you when you shared, you know, your your uh, your example in the product. So um, thanks again for walking us through that. Uh, especially it was it was really helpful to just see it come to life. Um, so it looks like we don't have any other questions. So just as we wrap up here, I just want to talk for 20 seconds about Team Ohana. You know, you heard Aaron's uh, pitch, so to speak. Uh, and now this is ours around strategic workforce planning. Um, you know, our platform enables you to do much more than just the small thing that Aaron showed, even though it was a really powerful thing. Um, there's a, a variety of different uh, modules within the platform, um, dynamic org charts, uh, the approvals that Aaron was talking about, being able to have full visibility into the hiring plan, um, and then see the budget impact of all of those things especially in scenarios. So um, the product continues to grow. Uh, and one of the big elements of it, as Aaron talked about, is the idea that it's pulling together and stitching together data from all of these different sources that previously had been siloed. And so for most companies, they're pulling all that data and putting it into a spreadsheet. Um, but, you know, that lacks the, the, the real time. It la it's lagging. Um, and you can't make proactive decisions around that. So um, this is where Team Ohana fits in the world. Uh, and if, if you're interested in seeing more of the platform than Aaron showed uh, and, and understanding how it may be helpful for you in your in your day to day, uh, we'd love to we'd love to do a personalized discussion where we're just hearing a lot about what your process looks like. Aaron told us all about his process today. We'd love to learn more about your process and sort of understand uh, where Team Ohana can fit in if possible. And uh, so the best way to do that is just by booking time with, with our team. Um, and we'll take a look at what your hiring plan looks like, what, what your growth looks like, and, and what your different systems are doing today uh, and how we might be able to fit into that and, and help make your life a little bit easier. Uh, and that's, that's ultimately the goal. So Aaron, uh, I want to say thanks so much for, uh, for joining us and going into detail uh, around how you do this because um, you know, there's a lot of pieces there and I think you did a great job of just, you know, giving the overview in, in a very, in a very meaningful and, and, and understandable way. So Aaron, thanks so much for joining us. I, I think we should do it again. I want to see you give more uh, <laughs> demos of the platform. That's what I want to see. Absolutely. Really, really appreciate you having me here as well. I had a great time. Love talking about this stuff. Love chatting with you guys. So it was a blast. Thanks everyone for joining. Sorry again about the confusion and, uh, and hopefully we'll see you on the next one. Take care. Thank you.